You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Thank you for your introduction and thank you also for inviting us here for this um, session. We appreciate it and we appreciate being able to share a bit about our corrections and our challenges, but also our successes with mental health and corrections. So I'll start off the presentation just by giving an, an overview of Bermuda and Department of Corrections. So we'll be, we, we'll be discussing the overview of our department, the management of mental health inmates from reception to discharge, challenges and successes, working with our stakeholders, and that includes our mental health clients and corrections committee. Best practices, we'll have some closing remarks, which will be short, and we wanna have the opportunity for any questions um, from the audience. So who are we? Um, we're, I'll speak about Bermuda first. We're an island in the Atlantic, just so that people can get the context. Um, we're, we're in the Atlantic Ocean by ourselves. We're in overseas, British overseas territory with approximately 65,000 um, population, general population of 65,000. So Department of Corrections, our mission is to protect the public and provide rehabilitative services. And our end product is really to have a more productive and positive citizen that's going back out in the community. Our beliefs, and I'll, I raise these and highlight the areas in red because this is what we're all about and, and this is what we believe, that those in our custody have the potential to change, even those with mental health challenges. We believe that our staff are our greatest asset in, in the achievement of our mission and that they have the potential to bring about change. So it's not just about the clinical staff, it's about our frontline staff as well, playing a role in the rehabilitation process. We believe that the Department of Corrections is an integral part of the entire Bermudian community. And we live with persons that come into our custody, our family sometimes, they're our neighbors, and they go back out into the community. We see them on a regular basis as well. And the fourth one, um, which, doesn't impact too much about what we're talking about today, but we believe that we should operate the department cost efficiently while retaining the ability to achieve our mission. I'll just give a brief overview of our facilities. We have three housing facilities. The first one being a maximum security facility, which is a male facility, and that's Westgate Correctional Facility. It has the capacity to house approximately 220 male inmates. And we have remand inmates and those that have been sentenced as well. And our inmates are classified as minimum, maximum, and medium security. So we have all three classifications in one facility. However, they are separated by housing units. Our next facility is the farm facility, which is a minimum security facility. And this facility concentrates on the reintegration of inmates back into the community. And we have a work release program, which is just about to get back started after dealing with COVID-19. And it also gives opportunities for inmates to participate in farming. So it's called the farm facility because we have three um, areas that we grow vegetables and fruits. The last facility is the co facility, and this is a facility that houses both female inmates, sentence, and remand, as well as male minimum security inmates who um, are in a program. It's a substance abuse in-house program called White Living House. Just a few stats, our current population is 123 unlocking this morning, 96 at Westgate, 17 at the farm facility, and 10 at the career facility. 
Uh, we have 20 mental health inmates and there are, of course, all three facilities. And that's approximately 16% of our population. Our recidivism rate is 15%, which is, uh, we'd like it to be lower, but um, it is fairly low. So I'm gonna pass it on to Julie and she'll speak about the management of mental health inmates um, from reception to discharge. And it also includes some case planning as well. Uh, morning, afternoon. Oh, okay. Um, with our clients, all clients, all inmates, once they enter into the facility, they are seen by um, health services. When we see them in health services, we do ask them a series of questions, um, which we have, and it includes their mental health, uh, very detailed about whether or not they've been um, involved in MWI or have or medications, are they seeing a psychiatrist or case manager or anything of that nature. They even talks about their, um, any thoughts of suicide, um, have they thought about it in the last, you know, when was the last time they thought about it if they have, have they ever attempted it at any time? And, um, you know, ask us a series of questions in a different way to see if they have um, any mental health illnesses, such as, you know, feeling that people are talking to them or feeling that people are, or, you know, watching them or anything of that nature. So on reception, everybody gets that, that questionnaire. And then from there, they are um, seen by the, if we do deem them to have any mental health problems, they are put on the list to be seen by the psychiatrist. We have a psychiatrist who comes in on a weekly basis, who sees all our mental health clients. So if we have one person that comes in on reception and we deem them or they're on medication, they are put on the list and they're seen that following week that the psychiatrist comes in. They are also seen by the medical officer as well, who um, in his, um, reception he can be if he feels anybody is um needing to be seen by the psychiatrist he can you know say let's put him on the list let him be reviewed as well so that happens within their first week and then um they're managed throughout the time frame that they're here if they need to be the psychiatrist determines if they want to see him on a weekly basis bi-weekly um you know when they need to be returned they continue with medication anything of that nature, and we'll just keep following up according to how the psychiatrist deems them needing to be um, seen. Um, they are also, there's case planning. I think Ms. Walker can go into more detail in reference to their case planning. It's that is in her, her regime. And um, I will let, come back, let her come back to that. When inmates who are um, mental health inmates, when they're ready for discharge, they are, um, you know, uh, we do discuss with MWI, sorry, I did should go back. We do, um, when they come in, we speak to MWI, we can get a list of medications that um, they may be on and we will continue with that. When they're discharged, we do the same release with MWI, letting them know that they are due to be the release. This is the, um, the medication they've been on, when they had their last injection, if there weren't any injections, and we do, you know, a discharge summary, and that's sent to their to MWI for them to follow up with them upon their discharge. And we do give at least a week to three weeks of medication with them when they when they are released. And I can let Ms. Um, Walker go into detail in the case planning as she has more insight on that. Good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. <laughs> um, in regards to the case planning for mental health inmates, we're going to talk more about um, some of the tools that we have to help manage their care, both while they're incarcerated and upon their discharge. We'll go into a little more detail about a, a monthly meeting that we hold with MWI, which is the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute. It is our main mental health provider for the island, as uh, we are not large enough to have our own um, cadre of mental health staff. Um, they do provide a psychiatrist for us, as well as providing the main um, mental health treatment for the island. Uh, case planning. Uh, we work with our um, mental health inmates uh, and 
as we would any other inmate in terms of running a battery of assessments and determining what they what kind of treatment they may need while while they're incarcerated. Uh, certainly, working with health services to ensure that that they continue on any kind of medication regime or any um, any type of um, of uh, therapy that they may be enrolled in with the psychologist, things of that nature, depending on what their specific diagnosis is. Then we also, where we find some of our biggest challenges, which we're going into next, would be housing. When we're looking at the release of the the inmates, then um, housing is always an issue. They're not uh, enough. Uh, housing areas here for any inmate getting out of that are leaving corrections and certainly not for the mental health patients. It's, it becomes even less. Most of them have cut their um, ties with their families or have elderly parents, things of that nature that kind of eliminates that. So we do our best to try to connect them with community resources such as housing um, and mental health treatment, court services, probation and parole once they leave here. Shall I go on into the challenges? Sure, you have your mic. <laughs> okay. So um, as I stated before, some of some of the challenges we have um, are is that our mental health population typically comes with co-occurring disorders whether that is um, substance abuse or, or another type of disorder. Uh, they tend to be non-compliant when we receive them. They don't tend to be on any type of medication or treatment regime. As I mentioned previously, they may have limited or no family support. Often they're homeless, which increases the likelihood that they might have a physical ailment due to um, not having proper medical care, not having uh, a, a good shelter, um, a shower, uh, being kept in unhygienic conditions, things of that nature. And again, the majority of them tend to have substance misuse issues as well, whether that's addiction or just regular abuse. And we have, um, and on our island, um, we do have the MWI, Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute. They provide a range of services for our mental health, for the mentally ill here in Bermuda. Unfortunately, as the commissioner stated, we only have a population on the island of about 64,000, and that means that we are limited in the scope of how of our ability to treat specialized populations. We don't have a facility to, to fit every ailment or any every, every type of mental illness or um, intellectual disability challenge out there. So um, at times we've had to uh, advocate for persons to be sent uh, overseas for treatment. We've tried to fit people into um, a treatment location that may not be a hundred percent appropriate for that their specific diagnosis, and often uh, they get caught in the gaps in between and they become homeless. If I can just add, um, sometimes the clients may have actually caused viol been violent at the mental health facility. So then that causes even more of an issue because that's the only facility that we have for mental health. And because of their past behavior, um, they may not necessarily be accepted back into that facility. Um, so that does pose a challenge with, with, this as, with us as well in terms of discharge planning. But even though we have some challenges, we do have some successes. So we'll move on to our successes. And 
When we speak about experienced staff, not only do we have the clinical staff, we, we have staff who work with the mentally challenged inmates. Um, so some of our frontline officers will work with them in terms of their um, getting, getting showers and bed and ensuring that their rooms are clean, trying to help them manage better. So we have um, our case managers as well. And the clinical staff are psychologists, um, program director Walker brings a wealth of experience as well. So Ms. Smith, I don't know if you wanna um, share more on this section. Yeah, also with the um, experienced staff, of course we have the mental health um, psychiatrist who comes in on a um, weekly basis as stated previously. We have our nurses, um, all of us have different experiences, but we also have um, mental health nurses who, who have worked at MWI or in another mental institute who bring their, their experience to, um, yeah, to prison, to corrections, sorry, when they come and, and work in this facility. So that is you know, a plus for us as we, we all are training, but then we have that specialized one or two nurses that are specialized in that area. Um, we also have well a uh, medical doctor as well who who has experience with mental health clients. Um, you want me to go on? Information sharing. We do a wealth of information sharing with outside stakeholders, um, MWI, court services. We we share a lot of information back and forth. Um, this is where we come up with the MHCC group, which I think we'll talk about it a little later. We have um, the, which I stated already, the mental health treatment court, which inmates um, go to court who are mental who have mental health illnesses and they're seen in court. And from court, they can determine which way they can go. They may not even have to come into prison if they are um, deemed, the crime is deemed not necessary to come in. Other treatments can be done for them and our mental health clients and corrections program, which is the MHCC that we have. I can speak a little bit on the mental health um, treatment court. Um, there have been success stories recently. Mm -hmm. I read in the newspaper, one of the uh, clients that attended the mental health treatment court, she was with us for a brief time um, on Rimon, but she's actually now working and is being productive in the community and complying with her treatment plan. So the mental health treatment court has seen some success. Um, the previous magistrate who was responsible for it um, had invested a lot of time and interest in the persons that attended the court to ensure that they had support and were able to function um, a normal life without um, Crime or less crime. Yeah. Less Yeah, they help them find jobs. I mean, they do a very vast, a lot of um, influence on the mental health client. I'm jumped ahead too fast. I'll go back. Sorry. <laughs> so, yes, it's as mentioned already about the intake screening. Yeah. And I would just add in terms of when we talk about experienced staff. Um, Mrs. Joel Benjamin mentioned that the officers play a significant role in trying and managing the day-to-day -day, um, needs of that population. We have we have a senior briefing at typically at all of our facilities on a daily basis where information is passed between custody staff, um, health services, um, clinical staff, things of that nature. So. It, it's important to keep that line of communication because the officers in the unit are are going to see the offenders more, and they they are often the ones who alert us to a change in behavior um, before we have the opportunity to see it for ourselves. Okay. Um, One of the successes that we found. Um, really has been helpful and and I won't speak a lot about it because I'm not directly involved with it, but we have an interagency committee. 
it's called the Mental Health Clients and Corrections. So it's a committee and the stakeholders include, um, we've spoke about MWI, that's what we call it for short, but it's Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute. Um, court services, so they court services deal with probation and parole. They're a separate department. They're not under the Department of Corrections or the same ministry as Corrections, um, but we work very closely with them, um, not only for our mental health clients, but for other persons as well. And other agencies are brought in as needed. Uh, Bermuda Housing Corporation that assists persons with housing and also for financial assistance. So this committee um, goes back about 10 years ago um, when it was determined that there was, there was a splinter and the agencies weren't, weren't speaking. And we didn't know, uh, we were discharging people and not really following up with uh, Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute to let them know that they were being discharged and putting a proper plan in place for them to follow or a plan was in place. However, the information wasn't communicated to Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute, or perhaps somebody was being released on probation and court services didn't have all of the information that they would need to supervise the person. So the committee was formed. Um, all of the stakeholders were quite um, committed to ensuring that our mental health clients, <clears throat> excuse me, not only receive the best care while in custody, but also upon release. So this is where this committee came about and it, it's been quite um, helpful and beneficial to the department and the clients as well. So I will hand over back to Ms. Smith. Yes, um, um, so with the mental health um, correction, um, clients in corrections, it was it was formed uh, roughly over ten years ago, like Ms. Joe Benjamin stated. Um, it was it was formed to have a communication um, um, with other stakeholders, so that when persons are released, we we start discussing inmates about three months to the prior to their release date, and then they discuss their housing, how we're going to manage them, you know, what type of um, probation will they um, be released on. Um, what you know? What would be put in place for them? Um, medication. Everything is discussed in a whole about the, the individual clients. It's it's um, every month. It's for an hour, and it you know it starts on time and finishes on time, which I think is a very good thing. <laughs> Everyone likes okay. We know we're going to this meeting. We're going to get there. We're going to finish on time. Um, it rotates to the various areas. Um, court services. Um, Mid Atlantic Wellness Institute all take turns in um, presenting the inmates. Um, we have recently, I think we have um, the psychiatrist who sits on the board as well. I think initially they wasn't involved, but here recently in the last few years they are now been involved in it. So they can put in their input as to um, the management of the mental health clients. Um, we also have the social workers, the nurses from prisons um, that are involved as well. Um, what else? The, we also have the community mental health workers from yeah. Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute, probation and parole officers. Um, yeah nurses from Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute, uh, case managers. We have custody representation as well uh, so that the custodial staff can present their, um, their opinions and information also. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Walker. <laughs> um, you can continue if there's anything else you wish to say um, in reference to Ms. Walker sits on the board as well. I would just say that um, not only does this help with the transitional planning, uh, it is also uh, very beneficial to us as in corrections, but when persons are intaked to our facilities, uh, we get the information from these stakeholders as well regarding the, what was happening on the outside prior to them coming in. 
Uh, so that helps us formulate our treatment plan for them as well and look at what might need to be done. And as Ms. Smith said, uh, the, a key component is that transitional planning to help them uh, return back into the community. Okay. So Mrs. Walker is part of the high risk offender management team, and that includes the Bermuda Police Service, uh, Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute again, Court Services, Department of Corrections. So not all of the mental health um, clients who are in our custody or who come through our care uh, would be tracked by the high risk offender management team, but some persons who have mental health have committed uh, very serious crimes and are considered a high risk offender. So there's another tracking system and support system. Um, sometimes they may be sex offenders and sex offenders automatically fall under this high risk offender management group. So Ms. Walker, if you can just share a little bit about how that team works for that particular. Okay. This, this team also meets on a monthly basis and includes the psychologist from court services, the psychologist from, um, from the Department of Corrections, uh, staff from the Mid-Atlantic Wellness, usually the psychiatrist and the psychiatric nurse, the head of the community psychiatric nurse, and it is managed through the Bermuda Police Service. And what this does in regards to our mental health clients, it, it, if they have, as the commissioner said, committed significant crime and they're on that list to be managed as high risk, then it gives the police service um, some resources in terms of their being able to deal with the person out in the community, what they might look out for. Uh, they often have, in have information that we may not have in regards to recent behavior, things of that nature. And that is all shared at the meeting. And we talk about how, how persons can be better managed in the community to help lower that risk and the possibility for reoffending. We've incorporated some of our best practices um, in the presentation previously, but just wanted to highlight a few of what we found to be best practices and what perhaps others who um, may be looking to improve their systems um, could implement. Um, definitely communicating and having information um, is one of the best practices that we found that helps us to manage those clients in our custody. Um, sort of having point persons at the facility and at the other agencies has also worked. Um, what we found, we, we always seem to get, one of our nurses who we hire seem to have a background in mental health. So that definitely um, is helpful not only from their experience and their knowledge, but they also usually have been in contact um, in another area, usually from the hospital with the clients who have mental health challenges. So they, they know their background and they're able to um, give us or share information. So that's just a few that I wanted to share and I will pass that on to, pass it on, I'm sorry, to, Julie and Ms. Walker. Mia, I'll just make mention, and like, like Ms. Ms. Joe Benjamin said, having the mental health nurse definitely is, is a big deal because they work with them at MWI and is able to share that information. Having the um, MHCC meeting so that, um, you know, the point of having that is to ha um, um, help limit the mental health inmates from returning back to prison, um, you know, helps them get housing, work, you know, works out all of that, continuing on the medication, 
So that's been the best practice for us. Um, having our weekly um, psycho psychiatrist in to see our mental health clients, um, our extensive um, reception form that we use, um, we get to pick up a lot of mental health illnesses, even if you know they they aren't expressing it at that time, we are able to pick it up just by some of the questions, the way they answer it, um, which is very good for us. Um, and that Ms. Walker can share her part. I, I, um, I, I certainly concur with everything that Mrs. Joe Benjamin and Ms. Smith have said. Uh, one of the things I think we as a, as a department have done a better job of in the recent years is trying to provide uh, training regarding mental health clients for all staff, um, whether they're clinical, custody, administrative, um, just so that they have a working knowledge of how best to, to work with the mental health client. And I think that has been very beneficial um, to all staff. And then I would also, I just want to re reiterate that the communication lines, a good, along with a good intake, I think our health services staff are very good at identifying any matters on their intake. And then that starts a good conversation where we can reach out with our, um, our community partners, specifically MWI and court services, and try to provide a sound treatment approach. One of the other things is that we also have a reporting system whereby staff can actually, um, we encourage that they write. However, if they notice that someone is um, just not acting themselves or there's some peculiar behavior, they can report that to their supervisor and generally it will go to health services. And most times there's fairly quick action. Um, health services will intervene and get the person back on track. Um, we had a situation probably about two years ago, if, um, I think about two years ago, where one of the inmates was um, definitely just not managing well he was not, his hygiene was poor, his uh, room, he was not keeping it tidy and neat. And that was shared with health services and health services worked very closely with Mid-Atlantic Wellness. Um, we did have to separate him from the main population for a period of time um, so that he could uh, resume his treatment. And we didn't have the opportunity to send him out to Mid-Atlantic, and if I, if I may mention, we actually have legislation which allows um, the Minister of Health to place a person at an MWI, Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute. So if they're in custody and they're unmanageable in our custody, they can be moved from our facility to the mental health um, facility. We didn't move this person. He was managed in house. It was it was a challenge. Um, however, he's now back into the main population, and he still has a long ways to go. But he's much better than he was previously. So that's just one of our sort of stories where we had a situation um, and then managed the person back to some good health, good mental health. And also, I can just add, um, just having a good rapport with our various stakeholders is, is definitely one of our best practices. Because with the mental health treatment in court, they can let us, they call us, say, hey, look, we just had such and such seen by the judge. He's going to be remanded. So, you know, here's his list of medication. Um, prepare for him to come. He's, he's, you know, they just give us an idea of what to expect. And just having that good relationship with the various stakeholders is definitely one of our biggest best practices as well. I think the other thing, um, other factor that would be is to is about 
Um, our staff have good working relationships as well with the clients. Um, sometimes they're able to, because when people are, are not mentally stable, sometimes they don't trust anybody. And because we're a small community and we have a small population, staff are able to build those relationships um, with inmates. And sometimes we have to rely on the frontline officers to actually be the first person to convince people that they need some type of help. So I think relying on the, on the frontline officers and with the training and awareness, mental health awareness, letting staff be aware of what to look for is definitely something that has been helpful. And I would encourage other agencies, other correctional facilities, other prisons to um, invest in, in, in the staff and have some training for them so that they can recognize um, when there is a mental health issue. And I'll just, um, in regards to our mental health and corrections meeting and the high risk offender management team, but more so the MHCC, uh, that relationship already being established was very beneficial to us a couple of years back where we had a client who was being released from corrections, who was still significantly mentally ill and a danger to himself and the public. Um, so we work collaboratively with court services and MWI, as well as the court system in order to have that person uh, sent to an overseas facility uh, so that they could receive the appropriate level of treatment. As, we, as I'd said before, we don't necessarily, we are not able to accommodate every mental illness or intellectual disability. So this person is now um, receiving treatment outside of Bermuda that will hopefully continue to make them healthier for return. But that having those relationships already established were, was key to the success and being able to get him transferred to another to outside of Bermuda. Um, the 20 people, I'm just going back to the 20 persons that we have in custody. Um, the mental illness range, um, so we have some that are manageable. Um, and others that need, need quite a bit of work. So I don't know if Ms. Smith, did you want to speak a little bit about um, the mental illnesses that they may have, um, what the range might be from? With, with the various clients that we have um, that come into our facility, range from um, inmates with schizophrenia, um, bipolar. Um, the most, and most of our clients, as stated already, do have co-occurring um, disorders where they, as they are, that do have that mental health issue, but also they have that um, substance use abuse as well. So the substance use is what, um, exacerbates their mental health. And once we get their substance abuse disorder under control, their mental health seems to um, um, levels out. <laughs> so we have a lot of our clients that have the co-occurring um, disorder, the substance abuse and the mental health working together. Thank you. Um, I see one of our, both of our assistant commissioners, um, one acting assistant commissioner and assistant commissioner of operations has joined us. Um, I don't we want to put him on the spot, but um, if there's anything that you'd like to share, Mr. Downey, in terms of operationally, how we manage um, our mental health clients, I'd invite you to share.
I, I was wondering if I might come in with a question at this point. Um, I've, I've noted a couple of questions. It's been a fascinating <clears throat> conversation. Um, and really, the um, uh, I, 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 you, you kind of answered this, and I wondered if it, a bit more detail would be useful about the scale. The smaller scale that you have to operate on means that uh, staff have to be trained to work in ways which are multidisciplinary. And whereas in a large institution or organization or place, you, you can have specialists. How much of that comes of people who that you employ um, and colleagues that you work with? Is that brought with them from their prior training or is that something that you have to do once you've employed, you know, once you once you've got established colleagues, that you have to then retrain people to facilitate that multi-modal way of working. I guess I can answer that a bit. Um, when we hire our nurses, for instance, they come with a background of um multiple multiple disciplinary. They they work in various areas. Um, to be able to work in this area, they have to have that background not just in one specific area, but they have to be able to deal with the medical side as well as the mental side of everything. And um, the staff, they get, I believe most of them get training, but they some do have some background from various social workers. Um, and, and, and is that, other. so is that informal training or is it formalized within your operations? Do you have like a, a, a a set process that people have to go through or is that something that is done if you like between peers we do have um mental health training incorporated into our to our um especially our officer training and uh, we have several components that that address mental health issues or matters uh, within the basic officer training Our, our clinical staff tend to have come, you know, from other backgrounds as well and bring, bring the knowledge with them typically. But for our officers, but although we do provide ongoing training for them as well, but our officers, we make sure that that's included in the regime of their orientation. And then the other, the other question that I think it was, was, you know, you, you touched on, which was about, um, the role of stakeholders, how much power do they have? So it sounds very cooperative and collaborative rather than directional, if you like, assertive. Um, how do you foster those uh, that that understanding of what the, the 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 balances, if you like, are between those areas for if you like for protection, self protection, public protection, self protection when somebody's in a say a crisis situation and how much of that is that part of the agency model that you're focused on that kind of um as you said you described needs-based work uh, how, how does that operate between the, the different agencies you, you you talked about it that you do have these conversations you see you know you said conversations just you know give us a flavor of what those conversations not not without any detail but you know what those conversations might be like sometimes they can get um pretty fiery you know because uh it um we may we may have a client uh in one of our facilities that we feel needs to be sectioned for mental health treatment and taken to MWI um, for treatment, you know, so um, we definitely, we have to, Ms. Smith and myself, we will, those things have to go to the commissioner's level and sometimes above in order to be resolved. Um, the day-to-day -day we do very well, um, but, you know, we all are trying to safeguard our, um, our mandates. Um, so we had another client who, were, who needed a medication adjustment. Um, we felt it should have been done at, at the and mental health right. treatment facility, but it, it ended up being done here at our facility. So sometimes, sometimes we, you know, sometimes yeah. our advice is followed, sometimes their advice is followed. 
and and you know on those where we can't come to agreement they sometimes get resolved at a higher level through the ministries even and then one other question that i got um which was kind of how much of the identification of mental and i think you touched on this because substance abuse is 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 a recurring issue how much of this is if you like a a social issue as opposed to it being a medical issue um where's the pressure come to you know it you have to deal with something which maybe should be anticipated elsewhere in society um i, I would say maybe half of it um does come from social issues as well which is why we have that collaboration with the outside stakeholders to they have an understanding that okay, on the outside he's been living here or he's been living with his parents and this is what's been happening so we get that full picture of what is going on with the um inmates while they're here so a lot of times we do realize it's just not um substance abuse or the substance abuse is occurring because of this social issue and once we get that social issue under control we're able to better um help the client in the long term and we've had successes where once we've got that social issue under control housing work and that client has been successful since continuing on medication has not relapsed and is doing doing well in the community but with that collaboration of all the um stakeholders is is, is the key I, i've got one last question for uh for, for kiva is in terms of international contacts because this is an international discussion and today we've heard from practitioners in J australia japan nigeria the uk what, what what's your um what, what would be your if you like your uh, takeaway that you offer that other people can learn from your practice not in you know we, we we can all learn from each other's practice that's that's a given but but what do you think is the thing that you offer and your team offer that would be something you would be you know, prou proud to export, I suppose, is a, a phrase to use. Um, I, I, I spoke about it earlier, but definitely the collaboration with the other agencies. Um, we also have the legislation in place. So if other countries, you know, don't have a strong legislative framework in place, um, I would I would encourage them to explore that. So we can use the legislation to, but when somebody is decompensating, we can use that legislation um, and the evidence that they're not doing well and need to be managed in a facility that is focused on mental health treatment. We're a correctional facility, so we're not the experts at mental health. Um, the legislation would work to have that person removed from the facility. So I know some jurisdictions, particularly in the um, Caribbean, I, I've ex been exposed to that. They don't have the legislation. I, um, I spoke with one of my colleagues in Jamaica and they, you know, it's just a movement from, from the mental health facility, the families don't want people. And then the corrections facilities are just the dumping ground for people with mental health issues. And Bermuda is not where we could, should be, but there's definitely a push in the community um, and with government agencies and some non-governmental agencies to work very closely with the mentally ill to ensure that they have housing. Um, but we still end up with the issue of not in my neighborhood, we have a group I, I believe it's called home, home, and they try to find find homes for uh, persons that are on the street may have uh, mental health issues, but then the community were up in arms that they're being housed in that that area. So one of the things that I didn't mention was um, that the court system actually now have a a staff member who works alone with or an advocate, more or less, that works with the clients and, um, you know, request for assessments to be done so that when a person's a sentence, 
the, the judge or magistrate has all of the information at hand and can make a uh, appropriate decision on whether the person should be in custody or rather there is some other sentence, non-custodial, that could be given. So I would take it from the best practice of the legislation, looking at the legislation and seeing how that, because that's the teeth. Um, without legislation, you can have the best collaborative, um, you know, relationships, but if you don't have any legislation or the authority to do certain things, then it's quite difficult. Well, that's a very, very clear statement of uh, of where you may be going next. So it's uh, <laughs> that's very good. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. Um, it's been very fascinating to hear this and to and to and to, to listen to the uh, the steps that you take. I think that's that comes through very thoughtfully and clear. Uh, in terms of how you bring this together, uh, as you say, uh, uh, in a situation which might feel, uh, you know, in isolation, maybe. Um, so you, 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 you know, it's it's really valuable that you shared this with our network, and and what we'll do is we'll make the, the video available so it can be reshared as well. So, thank you very much. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.